and welcome to Leaders Up Close. This is part of the uh, UCF's Engineering Leadership and Innovation Institute. We appreciate Duke uh, Energy for supporting this series. Uh, and I'm Tim Cotner, I'm the director of that institute. As you know, it's the greatest gig in the world. Uh, and today it's even greater, because who we have with us is Dr. John White. And there's a couple things we share. One, we are fellow Hokies, which is good. He's an industrial engineer, and I'm an industrial engineer, so that's good. And we both have a son and daughter. Uh, he, so there's probably a few other things along the way. We both read Chester Barnard. Um, and so what he'll share with you, though, is his view on leadership. And it comes from a unique perspective. And he'll share that in his career. He led engineers. He's teaching engineers. He teaches a course like this. And I'm sure over lunch I'll get some feedback on ways to change and improve, which is way cool. Um, but he understands leadership. And so he'll share his story with us again. And I think I'm supposed to say, here's Johnny. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. And I particularly appreciate uh, the chance to spend some time with you, not only here, but afterwards um, individually as you, as, you're, as you have desires. My time's your time. Um, let's just get right into it, though. When I say matters, I'm talking about matters as a noun and matters as a verb. So leadership matters. We'll first talk about some leadership matters. No, we're going to talk first about leadership matters, and then we'll talk about some leadership matters. So my perspectives, I come at it, as Tim indicated, from various perspectives. I've been in academia a long time. Um, in fact, I've been teaching uh, probably as long as some of your parents have been alive. Uh, I taught for the first time at Virginia Tech in uh, March of 1963. I have, over the years, I've taught over 4,000 engineering students at Virginia Tech, at Ohio State, at Georgia Tech, and at Arkansas. Also from point of business, I started out my career with Eastman Kodak. I've been on five public corporate boards. I started my own consulting firm, built it up and sold it to what was then Coopers and Librand, uh, now PricewaterhouseCoopers, a uh, big public accounting firm at the time. And uh, I think we had about 25 of our my former students from Georgia Tech were in the company when we sold the company. I went to the U.S. government, headed up the National Science Foundation's engineering directorate for a period of time, and then had an opportunity to serve as the deputy director. So, you know, as I think about that in those various places that I've been and uh, the industries with which I've worked, and I'm currently on the Motorola uh, board, and that's Motorola Solutions Board. It's the legacy company. And J.B. Hunt Transport uh, have rotated off the Eastman Chemical Board, the Russell Corporation Board, and Logility, which was a logistics software company based in Atlanta. But as I think about that, I think I have learned um, truly that leadership matters. I mean, leadership makes a huge difference. But along the way, I think I've also learned a few leadership matters I'd like to share with you today. But I have to say that the 11 years that I was in the crucible of the chancellor position at the University of Arkansas, I learned more about leadership, I think, than any other period in my life. Uh, it was a, a really a a tough, tough period of time, particularly the first part, because the university had their suspicions, particularly the faculty in the arts and humanities had suspicions about an engineer being the chancellor. And they had a stereotype about what an engineer would do. They were convinced that what I was going to try and do was turn University of Arkansas into a Georgia Tech. And that was not my intent at all. After all, I was an alumnus of the University of Arkansas. I'd grown up in the state. I went to school there. The only reason I left Georgia Tech to go back there was because it was going home. And uh, so 
I went there and boy, the first three years were really tough. Then people began to see the effects, began to see the changes. And then I got a lot more support. And then we had, we had quite a ride those 11 years. Let me ask, who's in your leadership hall of fame? Do you think about it? And I asked this of the students in my class to identify five individuals they would willingly follow. Who would they be? Five individuals, think about that. What's interesting is each time I have done that, and I've done that now four times, uh, one individual shows up in the top five, has shown up there every time. And it's interesting when you look at some surveys that have been done of business leaders around the country, that same individual pops up in everyone's top five list. I don't know if he's in yours or not. Okay. But he's in so many people's top list of leaders. And another one that inevitably shows up, it's very, very common to find him there. And she will also appear in many people's top five lists. So I don't know who's in your top five list, okay? Um, perhaps it's someone that I might not even know because I have students from various countries around the world and there's inevitably someone in that country that for that individual they think that's someone I would gladly follow. But you know what's really interesting is while we may debate about who's in our Leadership Hall of Fame, we will quickly come to an agreement, I think, of who's in our Leadership Hall of Shame. And the unfortunate thing is that over the last few years, we have had a record number of entries into the Leadership Hall of Shame. That it, you hardly can go a week and not see on TV or pick up and read in the newspaper something about someone else who has disappointed us. It doesn't matter what the field. It doesn't matter what sector of the economy will have individuals that we think are just terrific and the next thing we know, they've disappointed us. We had that at the University of Arkansas, our football coach. Off on a motorcycle with a young lady that she had just approached my wife and me two weeks before to see if we'd be able to come to her wedding. Well, that motorcycle accident cost Coach Petrino $8 million. That's what he had to walk away from in his contract. But it cost the institution more than that. Just like what happened at Penn State cost it the institution much more than what you might expect. Certainly a number of people lost their jobs, but the reputation, you know, and you can go through and it just seems like that there's no end to it. I mean, what is it going to take for, for you to recognize that in the blink of an eye, what you have spent your entire career and your life establishing it can be destroyed just like that. That's the situation I think that we're in as a nation. I think it's a situation we're in actually as an institution in higher education is to convey to our students the importance of integrity and character. In the class that I teach, I make index cards available and I ask the students to put on one side of the card what's the most important thing you learned today and on the other side, what would you like for me to talk about next time? I said, the first 10 minutes of the class are yours. I'll talk about anything you want to talk about. I don't get any questions about the course. All the questions I get are about life. I was asked by a student uh, a few years ago, he said, what's the best advice you could give us. 
I said, to thine own self be true. I said, when you look in the mirror, do you like what you see? Now, I'm not talking about your outward appearance. I'm talking about look deeply into your eyes. Do you like who you are? Do you like what you stand for? Are you pleased with who you are? Do you know yourself? Do you know what your values are? Do you know what mountain you are prepared to die on? Do you know what above all things you hold to be self-evident? Do you know what those things are for you? He said, in my class, you could probably cheat and you could get away with it. And I am very concerned about that. Not about that you can get away with it, but that you will cheat because you know something? You are shaping who you are. When we are born, we are given one big block of granite. And every action that we take, every thought we have, every word we speak, we're sculpting on that granite. And if you cheat on that test, you are just taking a big chunk out of that granite. You're sculpting who you are. You're sculpting what you stand for. And by the time you graduate, you will have defined yourself you're a cheater. Because you don't have a switch inside you that you can switch and say, today I'm going to be honest. Today I'm going to be dishonest. And so when you graduate and you go to work, you're going to find it easy to cheat on your employer. You'll probably cheat on your income taxes. And oh, by the way, you'll probably cheat on your spouse. I started a consulting firm. I had two partners in the firm. Hugh Kenny was the best consultant I have ever known. I was the rainmaker. I would generate the business and Hugh would make sure we delivered for the client. One day he came to me and he said, I've been offered an opportunity to go to California that will make me rich. I feel like for me and my family, I must take it. And I said, Hugh, I hate it, but I understand it. I want the best for you. Two weeks later, he came and he said, John, I'm staying. I said, why? He said, I had a vision. Some people would say it was a dream, but it was a vision. He said, there was a barge that was all in black and the people in it were dressed in black and they were partying and having a great time and you and I were standing on the dock and as the barge moved away, I stepped out onto the barge. I looked back and you had your hand out toward me. At the very last moment, I jumped back to be with you. I said, what's this about, you?" He said, the individuals on that barge would have been my partners in California. I knew that they cheated on their wives, and if they cheated on their wives, they'd cheat on me, and I know what you stand for. To thine own self be true. Because at the end of the day, that granite that you're sculpting, that's your tombstone. What do you want your legacy to be? What do you want to stand for? That's the question that is foremost in my mind for you and should be in your mind for yourself. Your most precious asset. Your most precious asset that no money whatsoever could buy for you is your reputation. The same is true for an institution. It's reputation. And what's the foundation for that? I would argue that it's integrity and character. It gets down to a simple five-letter word, trust. Trust. Can I trust you? Can you trust me? It's all about trust. Integrity and character, foremost, should be in our mind. The challenge you see that we're facing, I think, as a nation is to get back to the basics. I'm talking about integrity, character, decency, honesty, quality, service, customer focus, and leadership. Leadership matters. Now, we've got an unbelievable number of books on leadership. But I want to tell you something, that owning or reading a book on leadership isn't going to make you a great leader any more than owning or reading a book on diet is going to cause you to lose weight. 
It's just not going to happen, okay? What it's going to take is you're going to have to make some choices, make some commitments, and go out and work at it. That is true about leadership. It's certainly true about losing weight. I know. I definitely know. So, attitude, equipping ethics, mentoring, relationships, self-improvement, success, teamwork. There are many dimensions, and there are many attributes of leadership. Let me take a brief side excursion. In 2010, I was asked to speak at a leadership, engineering leadership conference, and I was asked to, I was on a panel asked to answer four questions. What are they? What in my undergraduate education prepared me for leadership? I might ask the same question of you. What in your undergraduate education is preparing you for leadership? What skills were missing from my education? What skills are missing from your education that would be beneficial? And how could the university, how can the College of Engineering help develop leaders after graduation? What more can be done through higher education to prepare graduates to become leaders in non-engineering fields, particularly in government and politics? We have too few engineers and scientists in the U.S. Congress, for sure. So I thought about that, and this is how I responded. I said, in my undergraduate education, I learned about ethics and integrity. I learned to persevere. I learned how to analyze and synthesize, how to deal with ambiguity and adversity. I learned that the world is not fair. I learned that in a very difficult circumstance. I learned to not let adversity define me. Adversity visits all of us in one form or another. And it's not the hand you're dealt, it's how you choose to play it that matters. You can argue all you want about it wasn't fair that the hand I was dealt was not as good as somebody else's hand. Hey, the measure of you is how well do you play the hand you're dealt. Okay? I learned how to work in groups and on teams. I learned about time management and prioritization. I learned about systems thinking. I learned to network. I learned, actually I learned to communicate pretty well while I was in university. And I learned business etiquette, but I learned that through the fraternity I was in, not in my major, that's for sure. What did I miss? I missed learning a lot of things. I missed learning the art of compromise. I was uncompromising. I was bullheaded and stubborn. I mean, it took me a long time, a long time. And I'm not proud of it to learn that sometimes I just need to give in. I need to give in, but not give up. Also, I didn't learn my strengths and weaknesses. I thought I was strong in everything. Took some really bad stumbling along the way to recognize I got weaknesses. And so as a leader, what I need to do is I need to know what my strengths and weaknesses are. And I must ensure that on the team are people who are strong in the areas where I'm weak. I didn't really value other academic disciplines the way I should as an undergraduate. I thought if you weren't majoring in engineering, it's because you were dumb. I mean, I, I, was so, I was so dumb myself. What would the world be like if we were all engineers, dull, <laughs> dull. You know, all of the academic disciplines will bring something to the party. And when we talk about diversity, diversity is more than how you look. It's also how you think. And people think differently in the academic disciplines. I didn't learn computer skills. We didn't have computers. I had a slide rule. You have no idea what that was. I didn't learn to speak another language. I didn't learn the value of stories. I have sense, and I think I'm a pretty good storyteller now. I didn't learn the value of diversity. We had no diversity. There were no women in my engineering classes. There were no minorities in my engineering classes. It was a terrible time in the history of this country. But I learned the value of diversity very quickly when I got out into a very diverse world. I didn't know that leadership was like pushing a ball uphill. You couldn't stop pushing. It's an every moment thing. 
it's 24 seven, it's 365. And I didn't learn well how to cope with stress. I didn't learn how to compartmentalize. I didn't learn that leadership is a journey, not a destination. It's not a title. Now, how could we develop leaders after graduation? This is what I said to that group then. We need to expose our students to leaders who majored in engineering. We need to provide graduates with role models. We as faculty need to be role models, and that's very difficult for faculty. I mean, it's very difficult because many faculty think leadership is not in any way a part of their responsibility. We need to encourage graduates to become active in their communities after they graduate. They need to be active in the profession. They need to be active in their alumni association. We need to encourage our graduates to look for opportunities to lead. My father said, those who write well, write a lot. Those who speak well, speak a lot. And I would add, those who lead well, lead a lot. Look for opportunities to lead. Make mistakes along the way. Recognize everyone does. Practice makes perfect, and if you don't believe that, you ought to read a book. Talent is overrated. It's a neat little book. Talent is overrated. It talks about the real key to success is not about how talented you are, but how diligently you practice. And it's more about what you practice and how you practice than anything else. What more can be done through higher education to prepare graduates to become leaders in non-engineering fields? And I gave a list, okay? But what's really interesting to me is that here at the University of Central Florida, you're already answering those questions for these students, and I am so proud of what you're doing. And those of you who are in the audience and benefiting from this don't understand just how fortunate you are. Not a lot of other universities have come to the recognition that we need to do this for our undergraduate students, okay? So I created a course, and uh, the course goals are prepare students to assume leadership roles, but also prepare students to make character-based leadership decisions by achieving specific learning objectives, and I go through that in the course. The students have to read eight books. The first one they read is by Steve Sample, the former president of the University of Southern California, Contrarian's Guide to Leadership. It's, it's generally the top rated book by the class. If it's not, it's one of the three that I'll mention. We read Machiavelli's The Prince. Uh, we read uh, one of Maxwell's books, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Lincoln on Leadership is also one that has been the highest rated at one of the times that I taught it. The students seem to really like it. And I think a lot of that is because of the focus of Lincoln and the movie that came out on Lincoln. And so reading about Lincoln on Leadership and Bill Clinton told me about this book when he was governor in Arkansas. He said, John, you need to read the book. It's a, it's a good book. I was a professor at Georgia Tech, and we happened to be at a conference together, and he said, that's a great book. And I have used it. Things, I go back and read it and realize how many things in that book I've adopted along the way and without even realizing it was coming from that book. Uh, then they choose an optional book out of a list of nine. They have to lead read Heifetz and Linsky's Leadership on the Line. Uh, the earlier book, Leadership Without Easy Answers, is a tough read. It's a tough read. It's a great book. It's a tough read. Um, and then Leading with Integrity by Kauf and Ray. And then finally, The Art of War by Sun Chu. We end with that. Um, and then we watch a movie, 12 Angry Men. And we need to do that. We do that right after the Heifetz book, uh, Leadership on the Line, because the things, uh, Heifetz leadership uh, principles and all are so well demonstrated by Henry Fonda in that old, old classic movie, 12 Angry Men. Then we invite speakers in. The upper left there is our current governor in Arkansas. Next to him is Greg Brown, who's the chairman and CEO of Motorola. Uh, then Mike Duke, who's the CEO at Walmart. John L. Hunt, she and her husband, J.B., started J.B. Hunt uh, Transport Services. Admiral Mike Johnson is in. I alternate him with Admiral Jack Buffington. They're civil engineering graduates. They were the head of the CBs in Vietnam and Iraq. Uh, Chris Lofgren is the next one there. Chris is the CEO at Schneider National in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Jeff Long, he's our athletics director. 
He's the one that had to deal with the uh, Petrino uh, case, and uh, it's um, he's now chairing the committee to determine who's going to play in the national championship uh, in football. Mary Pat McCarthy was uh, vice chairman of KPMG. Um, she was the highest uh, ranking woman, I think, in the public accounting business. She was offered the chairmanship at uh, KPMG and turned it down. Um, for family reasons, but she interacted with Jack Welch at GE. Uh, Steve Jobs tried two times to hire her at Apple and all, and she has some incredible, incredible lessons to share. Kim Needy, my boss in, in industrial engineering there, she's a terrific leader. Uh, Coleman Peterson, he was the head of HR with Walmart and uh, has some incredible lessons to share. Down at the lower left is John Roberts, the current president uh, and uh, CEO at J.B. Hunt. Next to him is Shelly Simpson. She's the president of one of the businesses at J.B. Hunt. Donnie Smith, he's the CEO at Tyson Foods. And then the general, Marty Steele, General Steele. Grew up in Fayetteville, came to the University of Arkansas as a freshman, dropped out after one semester, joined the Marines and went to Vietnam. His best friend died in his arms. He was given a battlefield promotion to corporal, the youngest in the history of the Marine Corps. He retired from the Marine Corps as a general. He lives in Tampa. He's, uh, when he comes and he talks, you could drop a pin in that classroom and you'd hear it bounce. He's got incredible incredible lessons to share about leadership. Adriana Lopez Wilhelm is um, Director of International IT with Tyson Foods and she's another of speakers. We've had several speakers over the years. These are just some that have been there recently. They learn a lot from these people, the students in the class. They learn that leaders are made into great leaders, not born as fully developed leaders. They, Learn that leaders make as few decisions as possible. Leadership is not all about making decisions. It's about assembling a team, getting people who can make great decisions around you. They delay making decisions until necessary. They don't have all the answers. They have lots of questions. They seek feedback. They do not judge books by their covers. They make mistakes but quickly remedy them. They do not engage in cover-up when they err. They're great followers. Great leaders are great followers. They come in all shapes, sizes, races, ages, faiths, ethnicities, genders, job titles, and personalities. And they simply cannot take a day off. They cannot take a day off. They're great listeners. They think before they act. They're risk takers. And they choose their words carefully. They choose their words very carefully. There's a quotation that certainly is most appropriate. We are sentenced by our sentences, the words you choose. When I was faced with the decision I had to make of firing Nolan Richardson, our basketball coach at the University of Arkansas, and when we went to court over all of that, and I was asked why, I said, there's a quotation I learned years ago. There are three things once done cannot be undone. An arrow that's left the bow, a life that's been lived, and a word that's been spoken. You can't unring the bell. Choose your words carefully. And don't delegate delivering bad news. If bad news is to be delivered, you deliver the bad news. Anyone can deliver the good news. But you owe it to the person to deliver the bad news yourself, particularly if you're having to relieve someone of their responsibilities. Leaders also process and synthesize information from lots of sources. They're seeking information. They have integrity and a zero tolerance for a lack of integrity. Okay. They're persistent, but not necessarily patient. 
In fact, when I ask what are your major weaknesses, it's amazing how many will say, I'm impatient. Impatience is not necessarily a weakness. It's how you deal with it. Don't let your impatience cause you to take actions against people that later you think, oh, if I'd just been more patient, okay? Be persistent. My staff soon learned that I am never, never, never satisfied. I'm often pleased, but I'm never satisfied. Often pleased, but never satisfied. I know we can always do better. I think that's in my DNA. It's probably all industrial engineers share that plague, that virus of continuous improvement. We know we can always do better. So often pleased, but never satisfied. And leaders endure significant stress. So you've got to find some outlet, some way to cope with that stress. And they have high levels of energy. They strive for balance in family and career and often, often don't achieve it. But as Donnie Smith, the CEO at Tyson Foods said, I don't balance, I rebalance. I recognize that there are times when my family sucks, so I stop and I rebalance. Greg Brown, the CEO, chairman at Motorola said, my son was in 318 basketball games. I was at 317 of them. I missed one because the Prime Minister of Israel changed the time of our appointment. John Roberts, the CEO at J.B. Hunt says, my assistant schedules everything, all of my kids' activities, puts them on my calendar, and they're just like any other business commitment. I show up Woody Allen said, 80% of success is showing up. Showing up matters. Leaders value diversity, and they have diverse teams. They need allies and confidants, and they have edge. They have edge, okay? They can make tough decisions. They may seem soft on the outside, but they can be tough when it's got to be time for toughness. Okay, they have staying power. They know when to hold them, they know when to fold them. They're imperfect, flawed individuals. They seek not the perks, the prestige of the position, but the opportunity to achieve great things through others. They practice deception. Yes, great leaders practice deception. Donnie Smith said he came in one day at Tyson Foods. He went to his office. Within 15 minutes, a vice president was there and said, are we selling the company? No. Why do you ask? You walked by the receptionist this morning. You didn't say good morning. He said, I was having a tough day. I didn't say good morning. The news spread like wildfire throughout the company. We're selling the company. People read into your body language. Mike Duke, CEO at Walmart, said, leaders are judged by their worst days, not their average days, not their best days. Leaders are judged by their worst days. You must always appear to have things under control. You must be deceptive. You may be struggling inside. You may not know how you're going to get through the day, but outward appearance, things are just fine. Thank you very much. We're in great shape. Don't you worry. I'm busy worrying enough for all of us, you know? But that's the burden. That's the responsibility of leadership. Great leaders care less about how great they are as leaders and care more about how great their teams are. And they serve the people they lead. It's about servant leadership. So now back to leadership matters. Collins in his book, Good Great, reminded us that good is the enemy of great. Also acceptable is the enemy of exceptional. I would argue that leadership is necessary but not sufficient to achieve greatness. You must have the right people in the right seats, in the right buses, especially in the driver's seats. It's about the people. It's about assembling the team. That's your primary responsibility. And timing can be everything. Machiavelli put it very well. Fortune, luck, destiny all play significant roles. As he said, fortune is the arbiter of one half of our actions 
but she still leaves us to direct the other half or perhaps a little less. I could tell you and share with you instances in my life where little insignificant things, I thought so at the time, had huge consequences in terms of my life journey. Just timing, just fortune, just destiny, just luck. I don't know what you want to call it. But as Machiavelli said, everyone sees what you appear to be. You see me as what I appear to be. But few really know what you are. Appearances can be misleading. Leadership matters now. Let's talk about some leadership matters. Peter Drucker in his book distinguished between effectiveness and efficiency. He says efficiency is how well you do things right. Effectiveness is how well you do the right things. Leaders must pay attention to both effectiveness and efficiency. They must ensure that the right things are being done right. And it means more than doing the legal, ethical, and moral thing. It means doing the right thing. And it means doing it all the time, not just some of the time. I was stunned when Bruce Pearl was removed as basketball coach at University of Tennessee and was asked, what did you learn from this? He said, I learned that I need to tell the truth most of the time. Excuse me? He still hadn't learned need to tell the truth all of the time. I learned that before I was five years old. Warm bottom made that, me learn that really quickly. Some more thoughts on leadership matters. It's communicating, daring to differ, empowering, visioning, succeeding, spying of others, refusing to fail, inspiring, innovating, teaming, learning, serving, dreaming, deciding. It's everyone's job. It's not what your job title is. Leadership is everyone's responsibility. Step up to the opportunities that present themselves and provide leadership. It's a contact sport. You need to stay in contact with the people you're leading. It's a team sport. It's not an individual thing. It's about the team. If you're out there and you're leading and there's no team behind you, <clears throat> as Maxwell said, you're just taking a walk. Okay? You're not leading at all. It's facing challenges. It's facing facts. Now, you aren't, none of you in here, I think, are old enough to know and remember the TV show <clears throat> Dragnet. Just the facts, ma'am, Joe Friday would say so. Instead, I'll tell you one that I know that you absolutely weren't around for, but you've heard about. <clears throat> Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, in The Sign of Four, Chapter One, said, some facts should be suppressed, or at least a just sense of proportion should be observed in treating them. Be careful about the so-called facts. What you consider to be a fact, others will consider to be fiction. You need to recognize and find out where truth is, but the truth has many faces. Depends very much upon the listener, the observer. But by the way, leadership is facing facts and taking risks. It's unending, and by the way, in case you haven't figured it out, leadership is very lonely. As chancellor at the University of Arkansas, there were some issues in which I had no one, no one with, with whom I could discuss those issues, no one. Couldn't do it with my boss, the president of the system. I would not have done it to my wife. She deserved better, but there was no one. In fact, I had two university presidents that I felt really good about. Paul Torgerson at Virginia Tech was one. Robert Kyatt at Ole Miss was another. Actually, Ray Bowen at Texas A&M was a third. They were three people that I, I could talk to. But I made the mistake. I talked to the president of another university in the Southeast Conference about a personnel matter and I was thinking about trying to decide what to do. And in less than a week, the person had heard from his counterpart at that other university, I'd had that discussion with the president. It's very lonely. There's no doubt about it. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Shakespeare knew it well. 
It's human nature. In Atlanta, there was a guy, Louis Grizzard, who wrote lots of great columns for the, uh, the newspaper there, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, but he also wrote great books. There was a TV series he had, Louis Grizzard. I, I love some of the titles of his books, oh my goodness. But my favorite of all was Shoot Low Boys, They're Riding Shetland Ponies. I think we do that way too often. In my high school commencement address, I quoted Henry Thoreau. If you built castles in the air, your work not need, need not be in vain. That's where they should be. Now put foundations on them. I have tended to always aim high. I aimed very high as dean of engineering at Georgia Tech. I aimed very high at the National Science Foundation. I aimed very high as chancellor at the University of Arkansas. And we achieved extraordinary things. And I think if I had aimed lower, we would have achieved less. Aim high, aim high. So that's my advice to you. I was going in to be voted on by the Board of Trustees about being the chancellor and one of our students in journalism came up and said, Dr. White, may I interview? And I said, I have to be quick. I've got to get in here. They're going to vote on me. And she said, well, I understand. I have one question. When you become chancellor, what's the first thing you're going to change? I said, I'm not going to change anything, but we're going to change a couple of things, and that's our attitude and our expectations. Attitude and expectations are the primary things we have to focus on and deal with among those people whom we are leading. Attitudes and expectations. In closing, let me share with you briefly very briefly, the leadership lessons learned from The Wizard of Oz. How many of you have seen that movie? You remember the scene toward the end where Dorothy comes back with the broom of the Wicked Witch and she's got Tin Man and Cowardly Lion and Scarecrow with her and her little dog, her dog's name is Toto, runs over, grabs the curtain, exposes the wizard as an ordinary man and Scarecrow they just know he's not going to deliver on the promises. And Scarecrow looks to Wizard and said, you humbug. And Wizard says, yes, yes, exactly so. I'm a humbug. And Dorothy said, oh, oh, you're a very bad man. And he responded, oh, no, my dear. I'm a very good man. I'm just a very bad wizard. It's really difficult when you have to fire someone. To let them understand it's about their job performance, not about who they are as a person. We associate our identity so much with what we do rather than who we are. Oh no, my dear, I'm a very good man. I'm just a very bad wizard. And Scarecrow said, but what about your promise? of courage for Cowardly Lion and a heart for Tin Man. And Cowardly Lion said, and brains for Scarecrow. Brains, said the wizard, that's a mediocre commodity. Every pusillanimous creature that's ever crawled the earth or slunk through slimy seas has a brain. Back where I come from, we have universities where people go to think great thoughts. And when they come out, they're deep thinkers and they have no more brains than you. But they have one thing you don't have, a diploma. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Universitas Committee Autum, e plurima unum, e pluribus unum, I confer upon you the honorary degree of Ph.D. And Scarecrow said, Ph.D.? And Wizard said, er, Doctor of Thinkology. And immediately Scarecrow said, the sum of square roots of any two sides of saucy strikes, two square roots remain inside. Oh, joy, rapture, I have a brain. There are two things to learn from that. Well, three things, actually. One is that L. Frank Baum, who wrote the book, must not be a very good mathematician. He tried to quote the Pythagorean theorem and got it wrong. You know it's the square of the two sides is equal to, the sum of the square of the two sides equals the square of the hypotenuse on a right triangle is what he was trying to say. But no, no, that's, that's not what he said. He said, the sum of the square roots of any two sides on a sausage triangle is the square of the main side. Now, I think, you know, that's not only is that wrong, but I think that Scarecrow wondered about it. That's why I said it so fast. Hope that no one might catch it. But the other thing you learn from that is in 1910, when that book was written, the author understood the value of the diploma. Hmm? 
And then the wizard looked to Carolee Lyon and says, as for you, my fine friend, you're the victim of disorganized thinking. You think because you run away from danger, you lack courage. You're confusing courage with wisdom. Back where I come from, we have men who, who once a year take their fortitude out of mothballs and parade down the main street of the city. Talking about the veterans with their uniforms. And they have no more courage than you, but they have one thing you don't have, a medal. In recognition of your exemplary conduct, meritorious conduct, and valor, I present you the Triple Cross and gave a medal. And Carol Ann says, oh, shucks, folks, I'm speechless. Then he turned to ten men. He says, as for you, my galvanized friend, you say that you want a heart. You don't know how lucky you are to not have one. Hearts will never be practical until they can be made unbreakable. And ten men said, but I... I still want one. Wizard said, back where I come from, there are people who do nothing all, all day but good deeds. They're called our own good deed doers. And they have no bigger heart than you, but they have something you don't have, a testimonial. In recognition of your extreme kindness, I present you this small token of our esteem and affection. And gave him a heart-shaped clock and said, but remember, my friend, that a heart is not judged by how much you love, but how much you're loved by others. Now, why do I share this at the end of this? Because those three things are the three essential attributes, I think, for leadership. You've got to be bright. You've got to have brains. You know? Smart trumps dumb. You've got to be bright. Well, you all pass that. Number two, you've got to have the courage to make wise choices, the courage to stand in the face of opposition and to do what's right every time, not just the popular thing, but rather what's right thing to do. And number three, it's not about whether you have a heart, it's how big your heart is, and do you have a servant's heart, is it all about how you can help others. Those are the three essential things, I think, for leadership captured in that little scene at the end of The Wizard of Oz. In the end, it's all about people. It's about caring for them, about motivating them, about developing them, about serving them, and I might say about loving them. About loving them. About caring so much for them. So, in summary, to fly on wings of eagles, leaders must lead. Leadership matters, so pay attention to leadership matters and enjoy the journey. Now, I would, oh, how did that sneak in there? Oh, my goodness, where did that come from? Oh, gee, would an engineer read Dilbert? Oh, how could that show up? So, questions? Thank you. Thank you well, very much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Incredible. Hey, those that got to go, go. Because I don't know, we're watching clock. You may want to stay, though. So here's the first question, John. I always get the first one. Good. It's probably unfair, but I was no, listening. No, that's fine. So you're at the point in your career. Yeah, there's a sweet spot here. Yeah. Right, and, and there's an exercise where people, you know, where I'm sitting or they're sitting, envision people talking about them after they leave. Right, and you talk about granite and sculpting. Yeah. So what's your legacy? Well, at the end of my day, I would want to, to be able to claim a quote that the Apostle Paul wrote in his second letter to Timothy. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith, and I want to add, and I made a difference. That's all I want to do, Tim, is to make a difference. The reason I decided to, to go into higher education from business is instead of measuring my net worth on financially or in terms of patents or anything else, it was on the ability to influence lives. And it's all about the students for me. It's all about the kids. Thank you. Yeah. You influenced me. 
and at least you touched 80 or 90 today. Yeah. And I know there's a bagillion before that. Well, I've had the good fortune to have had, uh, as I said, thousands upon thousands of young people. And it's amazing how many uh, emails or letters or something that I get that talk about it changed my life. That's, that's what it's all about. Second question? Yes, sir. You said there was a lot of adversity you had to face at some point. Yeah. Now where you're by yourself. Yeah. Which one of these main characteristics do you think that most valued the most in that you tried to help others out of? Well, the adversity that I had um, was I, I had a, a falling out with one of the faculty members when I was an undergraduate student. And that faculty member did everything he could to try to ruin me. And uh, I got turned down by every graduate student I applied to, grad, grad, graduate school I applied to. I applied to more than a dozen. And in February of 1963, my boss at Tennessee Eastman Company, Buck Newsom, went trout fishing with the department head of industrial engineering at Virginia Tech. Um, and uh, his name was Herb Manning. And the National Guard had been mobilized and sent to Berlin from the Southwest Virginia unit of the National Guard. So Herb Manning had lost two instructors in the IE department and didn't have enough people to teach for spring quarter that was coming up in two weeks. And he asked my boss from Eastman, I need somebody to teach. Can you recommend anyone? And Buck said, there's a guy who works for me. And I have no idea why Buck thought this. But he said, there's a guy who works for me who would be a great teacher. You ought to give him a chance. So he called him. And to make a long story much shorter, I went. And uh, I didn't even realize that I was given a tenure track instructor position. And I was there working on the master's, teaching full time, and I mean full, full time, and taking courses as I could. Was married by this time. and. Uh, first child was born. As a faculty member, I had access to student files, and I had a student in my class that I went to pull his file and accidentally pulled mine and opened it up, and it turned out that faculty member was the acting department head when I was applying to schools, and he wrote the worst letter. He said, don't ever admit this fellow to graduate school. He will poison the environment there he is bad for morale. We would never let him go to graduate school at the University of Arkansas. And uh, so right there at that moment, I decided I'm going to show him what I'm made of. So I went all the way through my graduate program with all A's. I achieved, I won basically all the awards that are available in my profession. Had two Book of the Year awards, had five textbooks out. I was elected president of the Institute of Industrial Engineers, and I looked up, and at the time when they were inducting me as president, here he came walking up the aisle. I went down to see him. He said, John, I am so proud of you. You were always one of my favorite students. <laughs> I called him by name. I said, you've had a big influence on my life. And that's all I said, and I went back. So I don't know that I answered your question, but at least I gave you a hint of that. But do you realize that on that cold, rainy Saturday morning, the last weekend in February in 1963, if my boss had decided to not go fishing, I wouldn't have been the chancellor of the University of Arkansas. talked a little bit about the importance of honesty and integrity yeah. um, and, and being forward and straight with people. And then later you mentioned um, deception. Yep. And so it seems a little fuzzy, and I was hoping you could sort of... You would never be, dis only appear to be in control. There's good kind of deception that's not going to harm people, but then there's also being deception where you're lying about something and you don't lie but you can appear to be in control when you aren't in control at all. You just got to watch, recognize people are your own stage. You're in life in a fishbowl. It's 24 seven. 
And you can't just say, I am really feeling like we may not make it. This company may go under. If you shared that with people, what do you think is going to happen? If I'm trying to decide, I need to lay someone off, and I've got a choice, and it's between you two. Should I be telling both of you that I think I'm, I'm thinking about laying one of you off? Huh. Why would I unnecessarily worry one of you? And in fact, why should I worry either one of you until ultimately the decision's made? Because I may change my mind. That's one of the things about putting off decisions as long as you can to get more information if you can. And um, so that's the one part in my class where the students, by the end of the course, they come to understand what I mean by deception. It's not by deceiving in the Machiavellian way, but it's rather playing a role because you're playing a role as a leader. You're a thespian. You're on stage. And so you have certain responsibilities that go with that role on stage. And inside you may be thinking, oh, I don't know how we're going to get through this. But outside you're just smiling and we're just fine. Because you instill confidence in others. They're looking to you. They're looking for signals. Um, so you've got that. But that's a great question. I'm still trying to sort it out. And I hope that when I'm being deceptive, that I'm not being dishonest. Hmm. Yeah, you had a question back here. Yeah. Yeah. And I was trying to say two things. You said courage and growth is hard, but a lot of trust is hard. You can apply courage and growth. Yeah. How did you go about winning over not only your view of showing them that you're doing what's best and not? It, it was a combination of things. It was, uh, in, in fact, there were two sort of defining moments, I think, in my time as chancellor. One was on the first day of classes in the year 2000 when a doctoral student walked into the office of his major professor and shot him. And it was in Kemple Hall, which was the same building for us as that building at Virginia Tech where that massacre occurred. We had, on the first day of classes, we had our university police on bike patrol, and there were two outside that building and got to that office within 45 seconds of that gunshot, and the student was still in the office. They tried to get in, they heard another gunshot, and the student took his own life. And he had the names of all of his committee members on his doctoral committee, because the committee had voted to end his pursuit of a doctorate. What was so ironic was his major professor was the only one who defended him, and he's the one he killed. And so I immediately was with the press, and we held lots of press conferences and keeping everyone up to date, held a thing for all the students, did everything I could to let people know what was going on. And the way that I handled that won over a lot of people. But for the students, we had a, a basketball game, and there was a thing, if a student made the free throw, and then he went and he made the three-point shot, and then if he made the half-court shot, he got $10,000. He made the free throw. He made the three-point shot. He went back, and he made the half-court shot. But the insurance company required that a video replay show that he had not stepped over the line. And so the staff member looked at the replay and the student had stepped over the line. And he announced to a full arena, we're not going to be able to pay the $10,000. He stepped over the line. And the uproar was as you might expect. I immediately looked to where the athletics director was seated, Frank Broyles. I looked to see what he was going to do. He got up out of his seat, he came down, and he exited the arena. So I said, excuse me. I got up and I went down and I spoke to the person there very quietly. I said, look, you get on this microphone and you announce 
the $10,000 is going to be paid. Frank Broyles is going to pay 5000 of it, and I'll pay 5000 of it. Just announce it. Went back to my seat. The announcement was made. Thunder spots. The student newspaper came out the next edition. Chancellor has a heart. Okay? It was a, I didn't even, I didn't know anybody was paying attention to me. Students came up to me and said, everyone in the arena was watching to see what you were going to do. I had no idea. I, I just did what I thought was right. First, I wanted to give the person whose responsibility this was, the athletics director, to see what he was going to do. He reports to me. When I saw he wasn't going to do it, I got up and just did it. Okay? I think those kinds of things, began. To, people began to see who I really was as a person. They weren't going by the resume. They weren't going by the degrees. They, began, they understood who John White was, not who Chancellor White is. And that was the important thing was to let them, let my humanity show, okay? Yes, sir. I didn't like it at all. The difficulty, that well, he and I had a great relationship. He came out after the Kentucky loss, and he said, if they'll pay me my money, I'll be gone tomorrow. Well, I thought it was just an emotional moment after a loss. And then I found out the next day that he said that to one of our arena managers before they even went to Kentucky. A month before, I had removed the dean of the Fulbright College from his possession, the big college at our university, because of some inappropriate things he said at a major fundraiser dinner. The guy lost it, did his stuff. I said, I've got to remove you from your position as dean. Why should I have different standards for an academic leader over an athletic leader. To be consistent, I felt like I've got to use the very same standards that I used for the dean with respect to the basketball coach. Furthermore, I had met with Coach Richardson the year before, and I had, he had just renewed his contract. I said, I want you to be happy. What's it gonna take for you to be happy? He said, I am happy. I said, well, let me tell you what I'm expecting from you. People around this state are watching you to see whether you're happy with your situation. We're on the same team. You're an important part of this team. I need you to be sending all kinds of signals that you are very pleased to be the basketball coach at the University of Arkansas. Then I went back to the office and I documented all that in writing. Sent him what became known in the trial as the Be Happy Memo. Okay. Obviously, when he then carried on like he did, he was not happy. He understood. So I just felt like I didn't have a choice. Just didn't have a choice. Uh, consistency, I think, is very, very important. People need to know what they can expect from you. If you're just all over the place, you know, that, that just sends all kinds of ripples through the organization. Low variance is always a good thing. Okay. But it's still, on the other hand, sometimes you want to be a little unpredictable. Just every once in a while. Just every once in a while. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. That's a great question. How did I deal with loneliness? Well, this has more to do with my religious faith than probably anything else. I realized I was not alone. And I, I, I think during that period of time, I read the Psalms more than I had ever read them in my life. I also, to, I would go into my closet, literally in my closet, is where I had my computer set up within a closet and I worked on a layperson's commentary on the Gospel of John. When I, that's, that was my way of dealing with it. Yeah. So, everybody's going to have a different way. But you have to figure out for yourself, what is that way? Okay? You've got to figure that out. That's very important. And by the way, it turns out, and I, I didn't even know about Heifetz books at the time. 
interesting in his book, there's over in the very toward the end about Sacred Heart and all of that, they, Heifetz and Linsky, addressed that very issue. And as I read it, I thought, my goodness, that's what I was doing. I had no idea. Okay? Anything else? Y'all are great. You are just great. Oh, here's one. Good, good. Well, of course, uh, I'm, I'm very good with Lincoln. I have no problem with Lincoln. And I have no difficulty with any of those that were put up there. But I would put my mom and dad in my leadership hall of fame. You're right. <clears throat> Hope I can keep it together on this. I can't. <clears throat> I won't look at you and I'll tell you. My mom died uh, August the 19th, 10 days short of her 101st birthday. My mom was a teacher and my dad was a teacher. I'm, I'm the product of educators. My mom, when she finished high school, she wanted to go to college, and it was in the Depression. And she was told if she would ride the school bus each day that went between Dermot, Arkansas, which was named for her great-grandfather, Charles McDermott, ride the school bus over to Monticello to Arkansas A&M College, go in and see the president, maybe she could get a job. She got there and she waited in line. The line had stretched out all into the campus. And it was late in the afternoon by the time she got in there. And the president said, I'm sorry, we don't have any jobs left. What does your father do? And she said, he's a plumber. Doesn't he have any money? No. People don't have money to pay him. They give what they can out of their gardens. Well, does he do anything else? She said, no, he's just a plumber. He said, surely he does something else. She said, well, he raises bees. Bees, he said. You bring me some honey and you can go to college. So she'd ride the bus every day and take two gallon jars of honey. And that's where she met my dad. <clears throat> They're in my leadership hall of fame. Who's in yours? Do they know it? Don't wait too long to let them know it. Fortunately, my parents knew it. My dad died at age 93. My mom at 101. They knew how I felt about them. We go through life and we juggle balls. And some of those are rubber balls. And if we drop them, they'll bounce and no harm, no foul. But some are crystal balls. Don't drop those balls. That's your health, that's your relationships. Now, faculty, close your ears. How you do on tests are rubber balls. In the grand scheme of things, recognize which are crystal and which are rubber and protect those crystal balls. 